Well, good morning. Good morning. God bless all of the people of the Most High God. We greet you this wonderful morning in the sweet name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. We say arise and shine and let's give God the glory for this is a brand new day that is full of brand new opportunities. No matter what you have been dealing with on this week, we are asking you to toss that aside, toss all the cares of this life off of you right now and enter into the rest of the Lord, enter into the peace of the Lord that is so present here when we come into his house. Yes, we know we're virtually, but when you have made your mind up to come and whether it's over media or whatever vehicle by which you have made your decision that I'm going to the house of the Lord today, it is a place where you can enter, where the atmosphere is conducive to signs, wonders, and miracles. It is uh, conducive to the yoke uh, destroying, the burden removing power of God, so that whatever you may have dealt with in this past week, God is here and he's ready, he's able through the Holy Spirit to minister to your need, to to charge you, to refill you, to restore you, to renew you. We are so thankful for that privilege and that opportunity. Hallelujah. When we call on the Lord, the Lord is right there to answer and to administer all the help. Well, he's already done that. And he's, he's able to let you know that you have the access and the, to, to the resource to tap into the ministering power of the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can do the work in your life as the same way that he ministered to Jesus during his ministry and throughout his life. Isn't that wonderful news? So we say peace be unto all of the saints of the most high God and let that peace again be multiplied unto all of you and may that peace that rests in you resonate and may it be an impartation into the lives of those who surround you or even come in proximity of your uh of your life or of of you being there to minister to them the ministry of hope. We thank God for all of you, to all the kingdom lifers, to my partners, to my supporters. We thank God for all of you, for your consistencies, for your faithfulness, and for all that you do to support uh, this ministry as well as to support Pastor Betty personally. We are of a grateful heart and we never will get tired of saying it. When we get tired of saying it, when we get uh, to the place that we don't think that it's needful to, to thank the people who are good to the ministry, who support the ministry, then that's when something we need uh, to be reinstilled in us. I have been raised by a wonderful woman of God who always taught me, always be thankful, always say thanks for anything that people do good for you, no matter if others look at it as uh, insignificant or of a lo low scale. Because, you know, people uh, don't think if you give them large sums of money or if you give them big gifts, then they expect that somebody's going to say thank you. But no, she says, whatever a person gives you, make sure you always be thankful because people just do not have to be good to you. And, uh, and so we are are of a grateful heart anytime that you're coming and you're clicking, you're just clicking that button to see uh, Kingdom Life Christian Center uh, service. We know, yes, we are so aware that we have spectators. We know people want to say, what is she saying or what is she doing? And they have no intentions of listening at the entirety of this lesson and coming for the right motive. We know they're not going to adhere to even the word coming out of my mouth because of some preconceived uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, uh uh, discrimination against women who teaching and then the list could go on or African-American women or whatever that is uh, that they may be discriminatory. So we know those people come, but I believe in my heart that they are not coming here 
by accident. If they hear two words, we know that God intended for them to click on that button. But for those of you who are intentional about attending Kingdom Life Christian Center virtual services who come back faithfully and click on this link. Those of you who are faithful to supporting us with sharing the broadcast to others and who are a commenting and also a subscribing to our channel. I want you to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And for my partners who support me on a consistent basis, monetarily speaking, and also with your support, you have a blessing with your name on it. Why? Because you are right here pouring into good soil. So thank all of you. And for those of you who are here for the very first time, by way of introduction, my name is Pastor Betty. I am Senior pastor and leader of this wonderful ministry entitled Kingdom Life Christian Center that is located right here on the northwest side of Chicago, Illinois. And we are excited about our vocation. We are excited about what God called us to do, our assignment, and excited about fulfilling our purpose. Is it always easy? No. Does it uh, come without challenge? No. Uh, but is it something that I love to do? Ab absolutely. And the moment that I stop loving to do it, then I have to go back and say, Lord, what's going on? Because with passion, it's the only way that reaches the heart of people. And with passion, it makes you stay diligent. It makes you stay accountable. And this role of pastorship is not an easy one. It's not for the weak at heart. And I know many people size me up by what age they think I'm at, I am. A lot of people think that I'm very young. People size all of us up by whatever criteria they have in their minds, whether this person can be even effective, or et cetera, whether they sizing you up by your marital status or sizing you up by what they think you've been, uh, been uh, exposed to, et cetera, et cetera. But we know that uh, whatever God has predestined and ordained, he glorifies and he justifies it. So thank all of you once again. And we want all of the first time visitors to to know this, that anytime that you would like to come back to Kingdom Life Christian Center, hallelujah, through our virtual platform via our YouTube channel, we want you to know you have a warm seat of welcome, and we are anticipating that time when we will be able to invite all of you to our brick and mortar location where we can come together. I can see your faces. For those consistent 50 plus people who are listening in my broadcast, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Would you continue to stay with us? And as a disclaimer right up front, I usually always want to say this and I forget because I have so much on my mind. I want to get to the word, but will you stay with us through the entirety of this sermon? It is a very good, um, a benefit to you when you always hear the conclusion of the matter because sometimes you say well i i'm not interested i don't know where she's going with this but if you just stay with me and i get to the heart of the lesson i'm trying to get there more sooner than later for those people who are not so patient enough to just stay and see what the service is about uh but stay through the entirety if you can't do it in one sitting or while we are live, then come back and visit it. Never leave things unfinished. Always uh, complete what you started. The Lord did it and that is his way. Complete what you start. Glory be to God. And if you didn't want to come back after that, then fine. But if you will stay with us through the entirety of this lesson. And I'm I believe that you will not be disappointed. You never know when the Holy Spirit is going to give you that nugget that you've been uh, questioning all week or all month or all year long. You've been having this question in regard to God, Jesus, spirituality, this whole salvation thing. And, and God put a word in my mouth for you. Glory be to God. So with that being said, we're going to move expeditiously through the service on today. We are setting this table. We have put out the fine linen for you. We have pulled out the best of the china to serve this uh, worthy meal because 
I look at the word of God as a meal. He said, if they hunger after me and if they thirst after me, if they have an appetite, they will be filled. And so he that hungers and thirsts and you are looking for a very good meal, I am, I am extending to you today an invitation to come and sit at the banquet table. And your host today is none other than Kingdom Life Christian Center, Pastor Betty. And we are here to serve you. Glory be to God. So thank God for all of that. And if this lesson doesn't seem like it is a lesson for you that you need currently, put it in your library because I can be I can tell you this for sure. One thing is that you're going to have to come back to this one. Okay, so we promised that we will start in part two and finish up where we um, stopped off at last week. And in our continued study, we realized that we're not going to be able to fit all of it even in this uh, service. And so we are going to do a part three and we'll stop when the Holy Spirit says stop. So without, with that being said, let us go into prayer. Dear precious Lord, the one who is mighty, the one who is just, the one who is holy, we thank you, Lord, for the excellency of your greatness. We thank you, Lord, for your, and to enter into the gates with thanksgiving and that enter court with praise. We are able to be fed and sit at the table. Hallelujah. And Father, we thank you that when we come before you in prayer, when we come before you in thanksgiving and adoration and worship, we have entered another realm. We have entered, hallelujah, in atmosphere that is conducive to science, wonders, and miracles. We have literally entered into the very presence of God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us that you have said as the king that we have been given admittance and access into your gates and then into the inner courts, which is the intimate place. Hallelujah. We thank you for that privilege. We count it an honor and a privilege to be in the presence of the Lord. Now, Father, as we come into this place and we have all gathered in your name to worship you and those who have not yet learned how to worship you because they have not uh, found that relationship and, and, and committed to that relationship. Let the power of the Holy Spirit hover over them until they are no longer the same, till they feel the presence of God, to know that you're real and you're real through the presence of your Holy Spirit. Help them to accept, hallelujah, the atonement that was made for our sins and the forgiveness of sin that came through that powerful name of Jesus, the one who came to die on the cross for our sins and said that I I take their guilt upon myself, hallelujah, so that they are now without any condemnation. He took the guilty sentence from following us as a stigma behind our name. And he called us righteousness to those who accepted him and to those who don't know him yet after they hear this word, let the demonstration and the power of the spirit of God engulf them so and, and take control of that heart. We, we speak to the stony heart and we till it, hallelujah, with the word of God until it is broken up into the seed of the word can go in and germinate and bring forth fruit. And God, we thank you that they will be running to the altar saying, what must I do to be saved? I never heard so much about this Jesus. I never knew he loved me so much in the absence of anyone ever telling me that they love me. I did not know that if they didn't love me, that the Lord God loves me and he can love me in a way, hallelujah, that will make up, hallelujah, that gap of earthly love. We thank you for your agape love for us, God, that you sent your innocent son here and it pleased you to bruise him on our behalf. Now we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will think through my mind and speak through my lips so the word of God will come forth unhindered, unchecked by demonic forces. Hallelujah, that I, my voice will be a compelling voice to those who are lost, that they will see, hallelujah, and I will point them to the cross and they will see the importance of the cross. Hallelujah, that it was for him, for them that he was stretched 
high, hallelujah, he was hung high and stretched wide, hallelujah, and then he became our go-between, hallelujah, that bridged the gap between God and man forevermore to those who accept him, oh, hallelujah, we give you glory, God, we give you honor, and we worship you today for that awesome act of love, hallelujah, it was your love, Father, it was your love, Abba, that sent him here, and it was the love of Jesus, and and his willingness is to see man through your eyes. And he willingly came here, hallelujah, stripped himself of his royal diadem and came here to this earth in human flesh, took and laid down the title of the son of God and became the son of man. Oh, what a love, what a love, what a love. Hallelujah, we thank you for today. Now I sit down and I thank you for the power of the word that is able to send, to bring deliverance, to bring healing, to bring restoration, hallelujah, to bring hope, hallelujah, and to in, encourage and develop and strengthen their faith in you. And we believe all these things to be so. Now take charge of this service and every service that has been uh, uh, rendered unto you on this, hallelujah, this day. Let all the praise and worship over all the globes come up as a sweet smell of incense of praise and worship to your name that is so due to your name. And be thou worshiped and be thou pleased with our praise. We praise you for it. We call it all done. And as I unfold this message, glory be to God, help the seed of the word to go way down deep in the soil of their heart until it is manifesting in the fruit. In the name of the Lord Jesus, it is so Bless every single one of my partners today. I apply the blood of Jesus to them, their household, their properties, their possessions, and everything, hallelujah, that is underneath their hands. That And I decree and declare today that everything that their hand touch, hallelujah, you will cause it to prosper, hallelujah. And as you are blessing kingdom life, and as kingdom life is doing kingdom work, hallelujah, we thank you that every partner, participate in the harvest that is coming for that they precious seed that they're sowing into this wonderful ministry. We decree it so whatever is in their home that is broken, it, it is being mended. It is being fixed. Glory be to God. You're bringing those broken pieces, no matter how many pieces they may think that their life is in, you're able to bring those pieces together and make that vessel, hallelujah, a vessel of honor. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. The breaking is not to break them, but the break as the potter do uh, a, a, a vessel or pottery on the potter's wheel. He only breaks it to make it better again because he sees maybe that there was some type of breach or flaw or crack in it. And then he doesn't throw it away, but he brings it back and he breaks it into pieces and mold it and shapes it until it's more better than the former. And we thank you for whatever brokenness had come into their lives whether that's through disobedience or even whether it's through nothing that they had that they did wrong, but just through their commitment to you and being under attack by the adversary. Whatever pain has come into their life, whatever sickness has entered their home, whatever uh, uh, demonic force against their finances that has come, we thank you today that you're the God that can bring it back together. You are El Shaddai, the God of abundance, the breasty one who nourishes and supplies everything that they need. And we thank you that there is nothing missing. And in their homes, there is nothing broken all the way down through the generations, hallelujah, in their family and to their children and to their children's children. We decree a blessing to God and we apply the blood of Jesus to the doorposts of their homes. And we thank you that everything that enters, hallelujah, is that which, hallelujah, has been ordained by God. And we come against every demonic force that comes, that it will not come nigh their dwelling. In Jesus' name it is so, and so it is. Hallelujah. Come on, say amen, people of God. Glory to God. And if you agree with that, I signify it right now by saying amen and amen. Man and amen. Hallelujah. Is the Lord good? I know he is. <laughs> you don't have to tell me. I know that he's good. And we're going to give you a very quick opening scripture. 
and uh, uh, we're going to read Psalms 118. Psalms 118. Hallelujah. We pray that you have had a blessed week so far, and we know that after you hear this word, you're going to have more uh, fuel in your tank, if you will, <laughs> uh, to, 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 to take you all the way through this week. Hallelujah. Being victorious, hallelujah, and then being encouraged in the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endured how forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endured forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endured forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy, hallelujah, endure forever. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Uh, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence even in princes. All nations compassed us about, but in the name of the Lord will I will I destroy them. I'm going to skip down to verse 13. Thou hast thou hast thrust sore at me that I may fall. But see your enemies thrust hard at you, the devil come at you so that you may fall. Glory be to God, but look at the butt. Thank God for the butt. But, hallelujah, the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and uh, my son and is um, become uh, my salvation. He is my strength and my son. You know, many people sing the blues today, but I'm telling you, God gave us a song that the angels cannot sing, and that song is that we've been redeemed. Then He gives us a song that we don't have to sing the about the blues and the and the woes and the cares of life, but we can sing a song of gladness and of good tidings, saying that the Lord has been good to me, no matter if my enemies came after me. The Lord was there to help me. He was there to lift me up. He put my feet upon the rock and placed it there. Oh, I could keep going on and on, but I got a word to preach to you today. So thank God for each and every one of you once again to all the kings and queens. Hallelujah. Wear your crowns and wear them proud. Hallelujah. Remember that you are royalty. You are a holy nation. You are cure your people that you're supposed to be showing forth the praises of the one who brought you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Glory be to God. And that is second Peter uh, um, two and nine is about how we are a holy nation, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, that that all of that, we named it. If you are ever in a dilemma about your identity and the devil trying to give you a low self-image of yourself, go and read that. Uh, let me just make sure I, give, I gave y'all the right reference because we want to make sure that you have these scriptures references so when the devil come, you 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 bring out your shot, your shot, pew. You shoot down the thought, cast down that imagination, all those high things that exalt itself against who you are in Christ and against the knowledge of God. Hallelujah. Because if you know who you are, you can walk with your head proud and, and lift it up. You know, sometimes people say, oh, those people, they just so bougie and, and so arrogant. Sometimes they're not arrogant. They're just, they just uh, was born into royalty. They was born in a certain, uh, um, what I want to say default setting and they were trained that way as children and they understand their royal status they understand who they are and they just walk in who they identify as who they were born as and we think sometimes it's arrogance and so in in the in the uh, kingdom of god the same way is true people will call christian believers arrogant now we got a lot of them now true true and, but it's in their own personal arrogance. But in Christ Jesus, you're somebody. Hold your head up. Stop going around looking like a, a, a Christian. Um, you say you're a Christian, but looking like you're mad that you are, that you, you, you are down and out. 
you sad and angry all the time. Hallelujah. Your head always bowed down. Stand erect. Put your shoulders back. Hold your head up. Even if you have to, if you're crying in, in, in your spirit, even if you, uh, things ain't going right in your spirit, at look, least look the part. Do you all think every time you see the royal family and they on that balcony and they waving and they grinning, they showing signs of strength, that they always feel str uh, strong, that they always are have everything going good. No, but they have a reputation to uphold. This is royalty. This is what royalty looks like. Come on. We're not saying um, pretend, but we saying that hold your head up. Don't be looking at the, at the world that they feel sorry for you <laughs> as a Christian believer. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What did I say I was doing? Um, I was giving you all that scripture. Uh, give me a minute. And uh, about you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a peculiar people. And that's First Peter, First Peter 2 and 9. But you are a chosen. See that? You are a chosen generation or a chosen, chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That means a dedicated nation, one who walks in righteousness. You are a peculiar people, not a weird, strange a uh, group of people not peculiar in that way, but you are a peculiar people. That means a special people that you should show forth the praises of him. Who is the him? Jesus, who have called the Lord, our father, who have called us out of darkness into what his very marvelous light. So when you feel down, when you your low self-esteem is at a low, then come and read who you are. Amen, amen, and amen. So now we're going to go into the heart of the lesson today. We've been talking about the title of this series is entitled, Don't See It, Don't Speak It, Because I Don't Believe It. And what have we been talking about? We've been talking about the viewpoint, um, the mindset of this culture today, both younger and old and they are making this statement indirectly through their actions even some are making this statement through uh, the the media through whatever people are doing social experiments asking people questions about who is jesus do they believe in jesus and some of the responses you all literally almost bring tears to my eyes to see the disdain that's this culture. I'm not talking, it seems, let me step back. It seems as if we give all of the teens and the youth bad raps. And believe me, we got a lot of bad stuff being done by that, that age group or that generation the Generation X and, and beyond and Zs. I can't keep up with all of what they call different generations. But ones who fall within that age bracket um, of between, that's our teenagers up to young adults that has this warped view on Christianity and how did they form that? I, I want to admit to you my suggestion the way anybody learns anything as default behaviors or how core values and beliefs are built is how you were trained when you were little. And when you have adults who don't know God, who don't want God, or who are atheists in their views of God, they therefore train their children that way. And some of them have had some experience with church and Christianity and they understand and they have drawn their own individual conclusions about what they will and will not believe in regard to God, in regard to Jesus being his son and the savior of the world, in regard to this thing we call Christianity that they call religion. They are two separate things, but that's not for this specific sermon, but they formed their decision. And sadly, the child, before 
they can make up their minds what they want. They have been indoctrinated with whatever the belief system of those parents or guardians were. And therefore we have the snowball effect where we are now faced with a culture, a generation, an age who, where most of them do not even believe in Jesus. Sadly, I asked the Lord, um, uh, I said, what's happening with our generation? But sadly, the generation, they did not have the opportunity to go to church like some of their parents or their guardians did. Somehow or another, um, those people who even those people group who have experienced Christ and now have turned from Christ, they did so only because of some painful experience that they have had in their lives. And the at the top of the list of that, I believe, is the death of a loved one, a death of a friend, a parent, a child, a, a companion, a, a husband or a wife. And they have now turned their backs on God because someone has convinced them if God was so good, why did he allow this to happen? Another lesson for another time. That, that question is very deep and it has to take time to unfold uh, that answer in order to convince people and some still will not be convinced. If Jesus during his life could not convince them that he was the son of God and he did all of those miracles, then we still have to come to the resolve that there are going to be a group of people that we will not just uh, be able to convince. It's the word people got, but we do our very best. And so these young people have not had the opportunity to choose. It's been chosen for them. And so therefore we have the culture that exists today of our young people and the, the politicians, the uh, officers, uh, everybody is trying to figure out what is the answer to the troubling youth in our cities, in our states, what, what is the rampage about with rioting, with having no regard for people's businesses, no regard for people who worked hard at, at uh, creating a wealth that they want to pass on as, as a legacy. Uh, they just feel privileged. They feel like they don't have to work. They feel like whatever they have to do to meet whatever their needs are, or just for the sake of fun, what they call fun, they do whatever they want to do. They have no, um, they haven't been trained, a lot of them, and I'm not saying this is a blanket statement for all, so don't take that that way, because I know my mom was a good mother. She raised all of her kids the same way, and some walked away, but they still have some core values and beliefs. But with that being said, I, some have not trained them at home. They have never taken the time to build a foundation for that young person. Because why? Some of those young people who are acting out, they are acting out because what they got at home, what they're doing seems better than what is at home. Some of them are desiring attention. This is very broad, so I'm just touching the surface. And I'm going by what the Holy Spirit has been telling me and I've been observing. Some of them don't have the attention at home. They have uh, parents who are strung out on substance abuse, who all they see is they lay up and shoot up. They have no time with them. They pay no attention to them. Some of them have never been told they've been loved. Some of them have the view that I am nothing. Everybody thinks I'm nothing. The people at school think I'm a trouble student. The uh, the people in the uh, the different types of systems think that I'm too bad to touch. They don't want to come um, and see and hear what's going on with me. I have no counselors, so to speak. The role models that they have before them, I'm just... I'm not coming against people, but I'm coming against that spirit. And they, the role models that are in front of our young people today have a lot to be desired. I'm going to say it like that. From, from uh, the people on our, our tubes, y'all know what I'm talking about, on, on, the, on our TV tubes, on our social media tubes, what they are portraying as the youth, they don't even take 
of being a mentor indirectly when you are in the view uh, point or in a prestigious role, you by default become somebody's mentor. Somebody's going to be looking at you, looking what you do. Now, I'm not saying you're responsible for that, but what you do is a direct effect on this generation. So the list is very long, just touching the surface. So they have had parents who made the decision to train them that way. And now they don't even really truly know evangelism, hallelujah, street evangelism or whatever it is, seeking after programs that we as believers who got the answer, we got the answer, y'all. I'm not saying we got the answer. We just haven't executed. We just haven't had enough people to execute. And so what it do it leave them? The world, it leaves them to the world and the devil is happy. So, so they have no really truly basic foundation. And then now this is what they're saying. This is what uh, this uh, lesson is about. Not only is the young people saying it, now the older people are, because it stemmed from them. And what are they saying? Don't see, don't speak it. And because I don't believe in it. What are we referring to? Don't see see anything prophetically come telling me what God has said to you. Don't see uh, what God has shown you to tell us to train the young people, to train uh, people to to witness to the, the older people, to tell them about Jesus. Don't see nothing that's, that's right. And then don't come speaking it to me because I don't believe in it. And that's the culture that we have. And when we have shut down and we are not speaking to them, we're not preaching the uncompromised word of God. When I say we, I'm talking about globally as Christian leaders, spiritual leaders, hallelujah, as pastors, evangelists, prophets, apostles, and teachers. We are spending our time on a lot of stuff, but the two, um, not the two, but the most important thing, the great commission that we've been given is to preach the gospel to the utmost parts of the world to go and to bring this great news to those who are lost, pointing them to Jesus and the cross. We are pointing them to our churches and our membership role. Y'all, I, I said last week as a disclaimer, and I forgot to say this, this is not, this is not a series that is for the weak at heart. So if you got to turning me off, I understand it, but I got to preach it as the Holy Spirit tells me. And so I'm not bashing anybody. I'm just speaking truth. And it's on a overall uh, average basis. Everybody does not fit this because we know that to be true. Everybody don't always fit what you're saying. It is to some and whoever this is to then say, ouch, do better and let's move on. But anyway, so going back to our point. So we are pointing them to join the church. We are pointing them to our ministry. We are pointing them to our programs instead of saying, let us point them to Christ. And then wherever they decide to go, let us be a support system that we're going to support them. If that, my church is not the right fit for them, then let me see how I can point them to the right church where they will flourish and grow. Because it's all about being uh, attached into the soil that is fertile and conducive to your growth. It is all about being under the shepherd that God has ordained for that person to be out, to make sure that they're operating at their ultimate best, that they are feeling, fulfilling their ultimate purpose, and they understand their destiny. And the person that they're under is a di direct reflection of what kind of training and what kind of nurturing, what kind of maturing that they will receive. And so that's why I said at the end, I said, I would love for all of you that, that gave your life to the Lord on this, this broadcast or who are listening to our backsider and rededicated your life to the Lord. I would love you to come and join Kingdom Life because my heart is that I'm giving you this word to 
provoke you to Christ. And if I birth you in the spirit, I will love for you to come because I know what I give. I know how I nurture. I know how I feed. And I would love for you to be here. But I said, but if you find that this is not the place for you, then still reach out to us and let us know that you gave your life to the Lord via our broadcast or you rededicated your life to the Lord if you're backslider via this broadcast. Why? For the fact we want to measure our effectiveness. We want to measure how many people are giving their lives to the Lord via this message that we are bringing. We want to know that you enjoyed the meal, just like you go to Yelp and you give uh, reviews on places that you buy your products and services for from you go get reviews about your favorite restaurant etc that restaurant wants to know what we're doing good what we what we can serve you better with what can we uh, introduce into the menu to make the the experience even more better that's what we're saying but then i say at the end that if you find that this is not the place then we still want to be helpful. You know, some people say, well, you don't want to join my church, go somewhere else. No, you're a soul. You need to be nurtured, protected until that seed gets, and that, uh, that you're growing, your, your roots get strong enough to stand on your own. We know the importance of being disciple. We know the importance of you understanding how, what, what holiness is all about, how you walk this way out circumspectly so that you won't get in there and see an example that is not the right example and start following that. And then years later, you say, I never knew that it was different, but we want to give you the uncompromised word of God. We want Jesus to be the center focus. Hallelujah. And we want you to hear the voice of the good shepherd. We want to empower you and train, train you, equip you to be successful Christian believer that would then go on and maybe yourself become a teacher, become a trailblazer, become a world changer. And so, but if you find that I am not the one and this shepherd's voice, because every sheep in the in the flock knows their Pacific shepherd voice, you can have thousands of sheep out in a pasture and they belong to different shepherds. Each flock belong to each, each shepherd and they could be mingled together in one pasture. But when one shepherd calls its sheep, only those sheep who are familiar with their shepherd's voice will move. I've seen videos of it. It's amazing to see. Go and search it out it, and they just do a yodel. And each of those shepherds almost sounds familiar, but the sheep would not budge if that shepherd yodel is not their shepherd, just like dogs know their masters. So what am I saying? We want to nurture you. We want you to grow. But, but importantly, we want to get you into the kingdom. And if kingdom life is not the place, that's where we want to go. And so when we're saying we need to, to figure out what we need to give these young people that will turn this scenario around, don't y'all come prophesying and telling us what God showed you about me. Don't come speaking no word in my life because I don't believe none of that. Glory be to God. And we need to change this around for young and the old until they can see Jesus. Just give it a try, you all. Listen just a little bit to Pastor Betty. And then you can make your own conclusion because at the end of the day, it is about you making your own choice. But so as our foundation no scripture for this lesson. I said all of that and I don't apologize. It's not on my paper, but I believe that God needed that to be said. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I am following you all the way. If you stop me and interject, I will obey. So the foundational scripture of this specific series is found was found in Isaiah chapter 30, verses one, then verses nine through 10. And we gave you all and explained that last week in part one. So you can go back there for a full explanation of the scripture. But this is what we came up with as the foundational scripture to correlate with our subject. And it said, it reads like this. And this is talking about God's own people, the, the rebellion nation of Israel. He says, woe to this rebellious children, said the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. And that is what is happening everywhere. 
that they got programs. They got A through Z, 12 step programs, six step programs, trying to get to uh, the root of what is the issues with our youth and what is the issue with different people groups. And we don't come against any program that is instrumental that is trying to help. But the, the formula is they don't have all the answers. If it's void of God's law and God's word and God's answers to the problem. And so he says, the, uh, they take counsel, they go on and they ask him the advice and they, they, they be in counsel, but it's not of me. They counsel, it's not of me. And they cover themselves with a covering, but not of my spirit, of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. So we said that they will continue to run to those, those who really are not looking for an answer, those who want to support what wrong they're doing to support their sins. We said that they, uh, uh, Timothy chapter four said they're going to reap to themselves uh, uh, teachers having itching ears, hallelujah, to tell them what they want to hear. And there are going to be many of those teachers that exist because why they have some other uh, alternative for drawing you to themselves. Hallelujah. They need your support. They need your money. They need your um your attendance, whatever that is. And so he said, they're going to keep on running and, and they don't want to hear the real truth. They're going to continue to run until they find someone who agrees with what they agree with, who will say, yes, that I believe the same way. How many of you know that everybody that agree with you are not your friends? But anyway, let's continue to go on. He says, but they want to add sin to sin. That's why they won't come to the true counselors and the true prophets. Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come and forever. He means take, uh, um, a, 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 do dictation, uh, take a a, a subscript, I mean, a description of what is happening here so that it can be shown to them later on at a, at a specific time that this is a rebellious people. This is what he wants them to write. They are lying children. They lie. Children that will not hear the law of the Lord. And that is what my subject is about. Don't see it and don't speak it to me because I don't believe it. But this is the scripture that says it best. From the words of God himself. This is the generation that is saying those that phrase. And they said they are telling, I will not hear the law of the Lord. It says, which say, and these are the people which say to the seers, who are seers, people who sees into the future. People are able to foretell events that are coming. Seers are people who God uses to see um, what he wants to say to his people and then use them as instruments like Pastor Betty is doing now, use them as instruments to speak on his behalf and to see what is coming ahead. And why is he trying to warn them? Why is he saying turn? All he's trying to do is keep you from destruction, um, destroying yourself or from the judgment that will come because of your evilness and because of your disobedience to God. And so he said, they say to the seers, don't see, see not. And then they say to the prophets, who is the prophets, the one who prophesied or foretell the future occurrences and events that the Lord shows them. They say to the prophets, not unto us. Don't you, don't you speak to us, write things. Speak unto us smooth things. That means things that are pleasing to, things that we could come into agreement with, things that we could say, hey, yeah, I can go with that. Yeah. Speak to me soft, nice, comfortable things. Just be so gentle with me. And 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 I don't want to hear all that God stuff. I don't want to hear all of that God wants us to turn from our, our sins. I don't want to hear all of that turn to righteousness. I don't want to hear that love your neighbor as yourself. I don't want to hear that uh, 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 
Don't commit adultery and fornication. Don't tell me what I, 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 I shouldn't be doing. Don't tell me that I shouldn't be on substance abuse. Just, just let me alone. Speak to me wonderful things that I can come on board and agree with and then prophesy deceit. See, they don't want to know what's right. They want to hear deceit. And I have never seen it so much in, in our time. But I don't want to spend too much on this scripture because we explained it last week. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. This is the same thing. Now, this is written way back <laughs> in the biblical times. But this is the same mindset of this culture. And it's even worse. And they said, get out of our way. Turn aside out of our path. We, don't, we didn't call you here. We didn't ask you to preach to us on the street. Why are they doing everything else on the street? You know what? Every time uh, somebody is doing something that is beneficial, that would change the, the tra trajectory of our culture and our world, they, they call the police. The police tries to make them go away. They, are, they don't want the preachers to be preaching on the street corner, the same corner where rivalry is going on, the same block and, and uh, radius where crime has been so high. They don't know if they leave the preacher there, that thing going to change around. Glory be to God, because number one, they're not just coming and preaching the word, what they're coming to do. They're coming with the spirit of God and they're coming in prayer and they're dismissing demonic forces over those regions. They are being the salt of the earth that the Lord called every Christian believer to be. What does salt do? Salt preserves. So what does salt do? The second thing, salt brings flavor to food. It is bland without the salt. And what does the Christian a believer do, it brings flavor to uh, what is going on. It's telling it said, that this world is going to be bland and full of evil and unrighteousness. But when the Christian believer come on scene, they're there to change the atmosphere, to take charge of the atmosphere, to make it do conducive. If you don't want to believe in righteousness, it make it conducive to good moral uh, living and character. Everything that you are trying to institute programs on to try to solve the issues of our society and the ages of this generation. And when we bring it through preaching, we are arrested. We are told to get off the corners when we really truly understand we have a right to be there like everybody else. But yet, if anyone has problems in their neighborhoods, in their residency, in, the, in their communities, or even in public places with people who are, are uh, blatantly displaying substance abuse that they're distributing in areas where there is uh, riotous parties going on, in areas where loud uh, music with very vulgar and, dis and uh, disgusting lyrics plays very, very loud on loudspeakers. And we can't even get the... the uh, the um, officers, uh, the officers to come and to tell them this is illegal. You you're violating the noise control, whatever. We can't even get them to come out. But if I go and I put my loudspeaker up and I'm telling them Jesus love you, if I go and I play some gospel music telling them about the love of Jesus, somebody is going to be disgruntled with that, and somebody gonna call the the, the uh, arresting officers. And what do they come do? You got to move from here. Or they try to disrupt what we're doing just for the sake, hallelujah, those people who feel uncomfortable. They call it hate when we are telling them, turn from your sins. Glory be to God. But people be out there threatening people all the time. And then what do you do? See, no, no action. You see, this is the culture that we're in. Don't see nothing. Don't speak nothing. Don't prophesy nothing. Prophesy to us good things. And if you don't got good things to say, if you can't blend with what we believe in, then get out of here. And, and then they throw away the answers to what they're seeking, spilling millions of dollars on it. And all they need to do is return, hallelujah, the authority and the respect to the church. And they will see this world change around. And I keep saying it and will keep saying it. Any nation that continue to backslide, 
and go away from God being the head of that nation, from the respect for God, for the respect that God's people are in for a bad uh, uh, experience. Glory be to God. And so, uh, so that's our foundation of scripture, Isaiah 30 verses 1 through 9 through 10. And that's what we're talking about in this teaching. We're, and so then the second foundation of scripture, I'm just going to read that, Micah 2 and 6. Prophesy ye not. This is what they're saying to the true prophet. Prophesy ye not. Say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take any shame. So as I continue my study and to receive additional content in regard to this sermon series, there was a truth that was revealed to me by the Holy Spirit. And that truth was that many times in our study of the word of God and in our attempt uh, to exegete the word of God, we stop short of reading the full context of the scriptures. And when this happens, we miss out on some of the true principles that the text is trying to show or demonstrate. And then we lose some of its original meaning. The tendency is that we use parts of scriptures and we run with it. And then we don't take a whole complete view of the scriptures as it is in context to the story. And therefore, within that story is a very profound principle that the Lord is trying to uh, show to the people of that that time and even to the church. And this is not bad. It is just not complete. It is important that as we move on, especially in very important teachings, teachings like I am doing now, that we take the time and we look at the full entirety of the text uh, to get the appropriate principle that we can then, then if we get the principles you are, we can put it into application. The same way I said that those youth have not sometimes been given, hallelujah, the foundation. When we preach, we cannot sometimes give them the principles and then they cannot execute what they have not really gotten a hold of. So for example, the, a very familiar passage of scripture, as I've been reading, a lot of our scriptures you're going to see are going to be coming out of the book of Jeremiah. Hallelujah, because Jeremiah had a profound assignment and we'll talk about that later. But a familiar passage of scripture is found in the book of Jeremiah. And it's frequently quoted and preached by the majority of the spiritual leaders and even by just believers. And that is found in Jeremiah where we quote, it's, and we're uh, re referring to Jeremiah 1 and 5, where it states, before you were formed in your mother's belly, I knew thee. And before you came forth out of the womb, that I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So that sounds really good. And we, we quote that when we want to say that uh, God giving me a specific assignment. He knew about me in my mother's womb. He's ordained me and set me apart. But we got, we, if you stop right there, we do not get the full principle. So in the midst of that profound proclamation, hallelujah, and affirmation of the Lord about Jeremiah, which is wonderful, we must understand what that whole scripture meant. It, Jeremiah being a child, he was not an adult, he was chosen uh, as a child, was about to embark upon one of the most challenging periods that will ever take place in any person's life, and especially in the life of a child. He was to be given a very specific set of directions that was given straight from the Lord that would put him in a less than desirable position, a very dangerous a very challenging and a very awkward position the Lord was setting him up. So even though we quote that, we don't fully understand when we say that statement and make that our confession, uh, Jeremiah 1 and 5, the same as the Lord made of Jeremiah, we don't really truly understand what that entails for our life when we confess that. Because God has a unique assignment that has got your name on it. He has a unique purpose. And if you make that proclamation, I've been ordained, set aside for his use. You don't know what he's about to set you up for. It could be one of the most less than desirable positions that anybody would ever desire. People want to 
look at people who are behind the pulpit, who carries these wonderful, impressive titles. They look at you and your glory part of that. They look at the preacher when he's and the, and the men of God and the women of God, they stand there behind the sacred desk. They're looking at how they dress. They're looking at how people come and admire them and, and how people uh, look up to them as mentors and how uh, they come to them and say, we enjoyed your message, et cetera, et cetera. And they look at the glamour of the position, but they don't know the true story behind a person who stands before you, a man and a woman of God on Sundays, how we look polished. We look it together. We have the word, but we, you don't understand what we went through to get that word. You don't understand the forces that we fight to deliver this word. You don't understand that even after delivering this word, the, the toil it takes on your physical body. You don't understand how many hours it takes a true, I'm talking about people who take this seriously and who is giving you real good word. You don't understand how many hours it takes for you to read that scripture and even to see as many times as you read it, what principle do the Lord want to give to his body? Because I take you all as precious. I, You are not my heritage. You are God's heritage. And many take this role as being Lord over God's heritage. And God warned about that. You all belong to him and no other man. He's given us stewardship over you as the shepherd, but don't get it twisted. We're not the chief shepherd. We're under shepherds. We serve the true shepherd, the shepherd that's mentioned in Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in any want or any lack. We are just his shepherds, hallelujah, that are in training, that has yielded our lives as instruments for him to flow through in the earth. Hallelujah. And so uh, when we uh, get behind the desk, people... Uh, aspire to be like us. I want to preach. I want to do this, even if they're not called, but they don't, as the proverbial saying said, uh, you don't, you want my story, but you want this glory, but you don't know my story. It's a lot behind that and truth. It's just not a cliche. It's really is those to whom much is given, much is required. And so it, it is not that's the problem that we have because many have not taken this role serious. That's why many have opened churches in the name of Christ. And there's nothing about Christ that's going on behind those doors because they put a name on the, on the board and put their title on the board. Don't mean that they were ordained a call. So going back to the point of when God calls you to something, don't go all the way. So we quote that. Understand when you quote that, that you've been ordained. What do you mean? That means you've been chosen. You've been set apart. You've got a specific assignment and God is looking for you to be obedient. So Jeremiah at a young, very young age, being a child, was about to embark on something that people of uh, of age would probably run from. From. And what was that, that charge? God said, I have made you a prophet to this nation. Uh, the full depth of the Lord's assignment for him is was that the Lord said, you're going to be my voice. You are going to be my spokesperson to this very hostile, this very stubborn, and this very evil nation that continue to ignore me. And now if they have not heard me, why would God put a child in this position? He is not even mature according to what we say but see this is proves that god do the extraordinary that means that god can take people a person of any age and anoint them and flow through them so if y'all don't want to say yes old people seniors y'all start messing up when you start getting old god don't need you you may have been in the way yes in the way a long time but god could raise up a five-year-old a seven-year-old a 10-year-old a teenager young adult and they will speak truth unapologetically and unafraid Hallelujah, if the Holy Spirit get a hold of them. And so this child was about to face a nation. He said, I made you a prophet to the nations as a child. Come on, you all. And I'm talking to you young people. If any young person is listening to me and you, you feel like you have not 
uh, you are a young person who wants to know the more of God in the right way. And you say, I, where is this place that can grow, grow me up and can, and grow my uh, desire to learn more about God who would give me good foundation. Cause see the young people, they've been out there in the world. When they come in church, they don't want all of the fluff that the older people starting to want. They want to know, and God's got an army of young people. Y'all, they're going to show us really how to do it. Well, if you're looking for that church, a young person, even a parent that listening, you say, I've been trying to get my child in a church that has substance, a, a, in a church that will build a good foundation that I grew up on, maybe not the same way, but tell them to come and, and introduce them to kingdom life. Christian said, I told the Lord, okay, we dealt with old people a long time. Send me the children, send me the, the teenagers, because if I can train them up, like you said, in the right way, if I can give them a foundation, if I can show them how to be godly, either kings, priests, or prophets, Kings, meaning a, a godly men and women in the marketplace who they get, they take their anointing to the marketplace, show them how to do that. And the ones who are anointed as part of the fivefold, if they call them to be pastor, evangelist, prophet, apostles, and teachers, or if they are called to be that prophet who foretell the future and, and speak prophetic words that are accurate, send them to me, Lord. And if you got a young person and you say, as that's what I've been waiting for, send them, send them here. And <clears throat> with the Lord's help uh, and with, with wisdom and knowledge, we will get the job done. But going back to the story, so we quote that, but Jeremiah, the whole uh, story doesn't stop with that one scripture, you all. If you uh, make a vow like that to the Lord, understand that you may be one that is going to face a culture that is saying what this title of this lesson is. Don't you see? nothing and don't come speaking it to me because I don't believe in it but you're gonna have to keep going nevertheless because God told you and I'm gonna give you the scripture later of what he said to Jeremiah if he didn't obey so he was in a this place he was being placed in a very vulnerable position by God the Father and know this as a side nugget uh as a, a kingdom nugget I mean Understand that God will never call you to something that he will not support you, that he do not feel like you're capable. If he told you could do it, don't you, I'm talking to young and old alike now, this, this quote is for you. Don't you go giving God your resume when he tells you to do something, to try to either overqualify yourself for it or to disqualify. On more occasion, people try to disqualify themselves Lord, I don't have the education. Lord, I don't <clears throat> have what uh, that minister have. I don't have the, the, the understanding of your word. If he tell you to do it, say yes, Lord. And whatever is required for you to do that, it's going to come as you are obedient and as you're moving in the direction of moving forward to what he told you to do. So uh, he put him in a very vulnerable place and he said a place to be hated, to be mocked, to be despised, to be rejected, to be isolated and to be alone. And these are the things people do not want to say yes to God uh, because they don't want to be placed in those situations. And so uh, so as spiritual leaders, as spokespersons, as ministers, by saying yes to the will of God for our lives, we have to abandon any glamour if you will, of what that position may be looking like with an understanding that behind that Pacific calling, there is a thing called accountability that you will have to agree to. Uh, and you have accountability to that role that many are not taking seriously today. If you are going to be a leader in this last hour, you must not be weak at heart. You must not be feeble minded. You must not have blinders on your eyes. You have to be a person that is going to be equitable. You cannot have respect of persons because of friendship and BFFs or, or relatives or, or whatever. You have to be able to be able to know how to be friendly and hold uh, individual friendly relationships, but not so close that it would cause you to compromise your voice, your principles, and 
uh, more importantly, uh, your assignment. You must make sure that you understand that God's predestination, his anointing, anointing and his choosing you on and the anointing on your life that how critical it is for you to pay attention to every single minute detail that is going to be handed down to you by the Lord asking you to follow these instructions without deviation and you must be able to walk as you walk out your assignment um, know that you are walking it out during an age that is hostile, during an age that is saying prophets, teachers, don't see anything and don't speak anything. Keep it to yourselves as we move on. And God is about to pull the covers off. Anything that is deceptive that's standing in your way, Glory be to God. Any false prophets, any false Christs, any false doctrine, God is about to uncover. Glory be to God. And we're going to give you scriptures that is going to be pointed toward false prophets. And why, again, this? Because God said for me to do it. Now, let's go um, Proverbs 27 and 6. I'm going to start with that. You should rather bear correction from a friend than to hear a lie from a false prophet. That's why that I am spending time on this subject in this series, because I believe that it is well overdue. Um, and it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but kisses of an enemy, they are deceitful. The blessings of the Lord, the favor of the Lord, the supernatural, the extraordinary happens in the lives of those who walk circumspectly and walk in righteousness and try to walk and keep the, the oracles and the laws of God. They know what comes to obedient children. Have you ever seen obedient, obedient children get um, rewarded and no disobedient children tries to get them in trouble so that they won't be rewarded. It's the same way with the enemy <laughs> and the same way with your enemies. When they see the blessings of God resting on you, when they see how anointed you are when you get up and you don't have to do a lot of shenanigans and because you have spent time with the Lord and because the anointing rests so heavily on you because you're operating in your right sphere of influence and giftedness and they see that they don't like it and the enemy start with his darts using people to come against you and they'll come around you they'll give you false accolades they'll give you kisses and even if they see you doing something that will jeopardize your anointing they won't correct you why they'll just let you go on because they care less about you losing that connection with the lord and by that anointing it, you won't lose it but the anointing diminishing and you're being that effective and so that's what the scripture is trying to say faithful are the wounds of a friend who comes to say hey what's going on I don't see that anointing flowing on you. and or, or if they see something in your life in love, uh, considering themselves come to you, especially for leaders, the leader come to you and say, hey, what's going on? What's going on in your life? Uh, I, you don't need to tell me everything, but but the Lord told me and, and that leader giving you what the Lord told you, that is a friend of yours. They want to see that anointing continue to flow. But someone who see you diminishing in that anointing and not as effective, they'll start coming, girl, you did good today. Girl, the Lord was all over you. And they know that you were sounding like sounding like a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal today. And hardly nobody was affected. And they saw it and they even talked about it. But they come give you false accolades because they want you to stay in that vein. Hallelujah. But a friend will come and they will give you this correction in love and concern. But a, a enemy will come and try to make you keep on following in that way. So I wanted to give you that to let you know what Pastor Betty's agenda is. I'm not coming to condemn you. I'm not coming to make you feel bad. I'm not coming uh, uh, destructively criticizing you. But I'm just coming to tell you what the Holy Spirit told me and coming to bring instructions and corrections so we can be all be better. So then let's go now. Numbers 22, Numbers chapter 22. <clears throat> and we're going to read a little bit today. Numbers 22 verses 1 through 35. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I know you all have gotten some. I felt like I'm going to preach the whole message today. 
So I'm not going to give you all no more than what the Holy Spirit tell me to give because I know I've given out a lot. Numbers 22 verse 1. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side, Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zephor, saw that all that Israel had done to the Amorites. They saw all that the Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak the son of Zephor was king of the Moabites at that time. So let's go back and recap. So we see here that the children of Israel uh, were in the plains of Moab, which are the land of the Moabites on the side of Jordan. Now, Balak was the son of Zephor, uh, had looked and saw that the children of Israel were really growing. That's what it in other words, what it was saying when he said that they had, and then he, he understood and saw what they had done to the Amorites and destroyed them. And so Moab now was afraid of the children of Israel, of all of this people, because why? They looked at the numbers, they were multiplying, and they became so distressed because of the children of Israel. Let me just throw in uh, a thought here. And this is why when I said, don't um, see it, don't say it, because we don't believe it. That is a tactic of the enemy to get you as a child of God to shut up. Because what they do know, they don't realize it, but in the spirit, they know the importance of the church. Importantly, more importantly, they know the influence of the church, not because us as people, humans, but because that we have this God that nobody can contend with on our side. They know if they don't admit it, that church, true, righteous people call the church, the body of believers are influencers in this world. <clears throat> and if we could get them, the church, the body, the people of God to stop seeing what God is showing them and then which would turn into them not saying what God tells them to say, that they can go on being comfortable in their sins, being comfortable in their unrighteousness, being comfortable in setting ungodly laws and inequality laws. They could be comfortable in doing whatever the heart pleases them as Sodom and Gomorrah was without any interference and without anybody having anything to say about it. And I want to add this tidbit. It is not just the church who have problems with some of these ungodly laws. There are good moral people who have been grown up in good moral homes, who have good core uh, values and belief systems that has been based off of some foundation of the scriptures, whether in their past from their parents, grandparents or whatever. So they have some ounce of seed in them that keeps them um, uh, trying to uh, uphold um, what I want to say, civil and, and uh, moral law. We know that it's only to a certain degree that they could do that, but they do. So in this story, they see these children of Israel, which is the terror, which has been triumphing over their enemies. And now they see them growing and the enemy is upset. And so when the church begins to multiply, when the church gets on the scene like we're supposed to be on the scene. And guess what, you all? The good news is that it's going to happen. If God has to use a few he was saved by few or by many. But before it's all said and done, the church is going to be a glorious body of Christ. They're going to be operating in the supernatural. They're going to be seeing the extraordinary on a regular basis. And we ain't going to be, whoa, look what God did. It's going to be commonplace, the miracles and things that God is going to do through his church because the sake of the time. And he knows that many will not believe without a sign. Hallelujah. But anyway, so when they saw them, they became distressed. And then Moab 
said unto their elders of Midian, now shall this company lick us up. So he's he's like, they're going to lick us up like dog lick water. In other words, all that are around us and uh, about us as the ox licked up the grass of the field, like the ox just devoured the field, eating the grass. He said, that's just how the children of Israel going to do to us. In other words, they need to put a stop to these people. Okay, let's continue to go on. And Balak, now Balak, remember, is the son of Ziphor, who was the king. So this is the king's son, Balak, uh, of the Moabites at the time. And then he sent messengers, therefore, uh, to Balaam. So Balak is B-A-L-A-K. Balaam is B-A-L-A-A-M. For those of you who do have, don't have your Bibles in front of you. So keep those separate because it sound alike. So he sent messengers, therefore, to Balaam, the son of Beor, to uh, Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Talk about the children of Israel who was bound in bondage in Egypt. Behold, they cover. You know how people exaggerate, but this is how it seemed to them. They cover the face of the earth. That means, and they abide over against me so it means that they are great in multitude in number it's a lot of them and that's what they said it's a lot of y'all christians go away you don't want us to go away anyway he now is soliciting the service of balaam he says in verse number six come now therefore i pray thee and curse this people for they are too mighty for me pre-adventure I shall prevail that we may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land for what that he whom thou blessed is blessed and he whom you curse is cursed. So Balaam had the reputation and they knew that he could get things done. They had seen it before that we understand Balaam who you are. I know whom you bless we found out they be blessed. It, and whomever you curse, we find out they be cursed. Now I need you to take that gift that you got, come on my side, and I want you to perform a curse on these children of Israel, okay? So let's continue to go. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards Listen at this with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto, unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. Okay. So the elders come into Midian uh, and they had in their hand uh, uh, rewards of foretelling. And they came to Balaam and told him what the words of Balak was, which is come and curse this people. Okay, verse number eight, and he said unto them, lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me, and the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. So in other words, he said, let's see what the God's got to say about it. We said last week, you want to know what God's got to say about it. Whenever he tells you to speak, you can't go by what the culture is saying. Don't see it. Don't speak it because I don't believe it. No, irregardless of whether they believe it, accept it, embrace it or not. If God says, see it, if he shows it to you, he means for you to use what he showed you. And then he wants you to speak it as he says, speak it. And so he said, okay, abide with me. I've heard the requests of Balak. Now let me go see what the Lord says. Very wise. Verse nine. And God came unto Balaam and said, what men are these with thee? The Lord is looking at his company. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Some of you, 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 you couldn't stand up against these people that's telling you, I know you're a Christian, but if you want to be our friend, if you want to be around us and you, you're cool with us, we get good vibes off of you. That's that's not a good compliment for a Christian believer for unsaved to say that. Now, we're supposed to be cordial, supposed to be friendly and nice, but when they feel very comfortable around you like that and say, hey, we got good vibes together, something ain't quite right. But anyway, a, a God came up to Balaam and said, wait a minute, I'm observing your company. Now, who is these men? 
Okay, let's continue to read 10. And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zephyr, uh, Zippor, king of Moab, have sent unto me, saying, sent messengers, verse 11, behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Preadventure, I shall be able to overcome them, and I will be able to drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, thou shalt not go with them. Emphatically, here's my answer. The answer is no. Okay. Thou shalt not curse the people for they are blessed. And another kingdom, another. I don't care who tried to curse you. Witches, warlocks, sorcerers, other uh, humans, um, a voodoo is whoever they shall be who curse what God has blessed, it will not work. So if you be an instrument in trying to go against what God has ordained, what he has anointed, what he has appointed and who he has chosen, you better watch it because God said, if, let me continue to read and give you the scripture. He says, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princess of Balak, he didn't argue with God. He said, well, God, he just got up in the morning, went to them and said, get you into your land for, come on, somebody, the Lord underline refuseth to give me leave to go with you. The Lord, in other words, has said no. And the princess of Moab rose up and they went to Balak returned back and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Verse 15, and Balak sent yet again. I'm telling you, the world don't give up. If they tell you to get out and then you go back, they sometimes they don't change their mind. They say, I meant what I said, said what I meant. We don't want you here. But anyway, if God tells you to deliver word, if he tells you to be there and to go back, you better obey God. But anyway, um, and the princess of Moab said to him, they refused to come with us. Balak sent yet again. This time he's going to send some more impressive people thinking that may change his mind. So he sent now not just servants, but he sent the princes more and more honorable than the ones he sent before. Verse 16, and they came to Balaam and said to him, thus said Balak, the son of Zephor, let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to seal this deal. If you just come on and agree, I will give you this. So that's what I'm saying. The world said, if you just be quiet a little bit, don't be so bold about your witness for God. Do it, do it quietly and, and, and discreetly and not so in public. Uh, you all wicked, y'all, that little corner. Stay inside your little churches and y'all preaching there. But don't come out on the street with your bullhorn and, and, and your pH systems. And don't go to the parks, to the events and have prayer tents. Don't go out there street witnessing. Stay just in behind the four walls of your church and y'all preach to each other and, be, and do all the shouting and hollering and screaming that you want to. Just leave us alone. Hallelujah. And if you do this, we promise to give you this. This land. We probably promise to uh, bring you before uh, the board so they can release the zoning and you can have your church here. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, land and real estate is prohibited from the church like crazy. But if you have any club you want to build, a liquor store, they have very little problem. You put an institution in that could change that whole neighborhood, they fight against you and they use the zoning to do it. I know I'm saying some strong stuff, but I can't help it. It is just the truth. It is just my experience. Glory to God. But then he says, because so they promises you, you think if you come and if you stay on the side of uh, uh, inclusivity, including everything and 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 we would give you this platform and we will we will get behind you and we will sanction your programs and the list could go on y'all think this stuff don't happen but anyway okay he says if you would do this for me he said let nothing get in your way it would be worth the row in other words so look at verse 17 i will promote you 
unto very great honor. And I will do whatsoever you tell me to do. What well, It says, whatsoever you say unto me. Come therefore, just come, I pray thee, and curse me, this people. That was his agenda. And many are manipulating God's leaders. They're manipulating their voice. They're, the leaders begin to, they're speaking, but they don't have no voice. Meaning it, it's not caring anyway. Why? Because their voice have been compromised. Because why? They need what the, 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 the uh, grant it says. They need certain things they think to build their church to an impressive level to get more land to get more influence and to get them on their side and the devil is a lie we shall not bow our knee to bail glory be to god only God has in control what you need for your ministry. God can move on the hearts of kings and massage a stony heart and make it lean in your favor in your direction without your compromise hallelujah and we see it you want to get the movie deal you want to get that book you want to get in mainstream you want this and you want that you want the Ephesus and you want all of this and you're compromising your voice because what they have promised you we even read it to you over in Deuteronomy God warned Moses he said this this company is too great for you these people are growing and they too they too much for you to be counseling them from sun up to sundown. And by the advice of your father-in-law, you need to break out this company, put over these people, judges who can judge these small matters. <clears throat> and if there's a big matter, then they could come to you. But don't just put any judge over them. I want you to put judges over them that are of a good reputation. And he said, and this is one of the things that you are to command them, that none of the judges are able to accept gifts from anybody. Because what gifts do, I understand it. It blinds their visions. It makes them become uh, inequitable. They won't have uh, they will have respect over a person based off of gifts given by individuals. So they are prohibited from accepting any gifts from anybody. All they're supposed to do is judge the people in righteousness. And so getting back to my point, so they are trying to buy this man's ability, prostitute his gift, if you will, coerce him and, and bamboozle him into disobeying God for the sake of what they have to offer them. Okay, but let's continue to read. Whew, I got a little excited there. I see a lot of this stuff, people of God. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, if Balak would give me this house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or to do any more than what he said. And that's what I'm saying. They don't want to hear from us. They don't want us to see. They don't want us to prophesy. They don't want us to preach. They don't want us to lift up our voice like a trumpet. They don't want us to show the people the transgression. They don't want us to tell them what thus said the Lord. They want us to sugarcoat everything so that it could be pleasing to all people at all times so everybody can live in harmony and we still don't have it come on y'all the ones who who are blending still don't have the harmony because it just won't happen that way and he says but if if he comes and offer me a house full of silver and gold it is not enough for me to disobey the voice of the lord okay that's in other words what he's saying and so then now verse 19 now therefore i pray you tarry ye also here this night that i may know what the lord will say unto me more so let's let's see if god's going to say anything less now, I don't know if I would go back to the Lord of God emphatically told me, but he said, let me see what God has to say. And so now in verse 20, this is the second uh, proposition that uh, Balak is given to Balaam. And so then and God said unto Balaam at night and said unto him, if the men come to call you, this is the instructions, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I say unto you, that shall you do. I'm going to allow you to go, but you are only to go if you adhere to whatever I say to you when I say it to you. That's in other words what it's saying. Verse 21, and Balaam rose up in the morning, saddled his ass, and went to the prince of Moab. 
And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants was with him. I kind of, I, I paused there only because we, we see here that God tells him to go. Um, but then he's like angry with him when he goes. And the Holy Spirit, I said, Holy Spirit, what, what, what is this saying? So in other words, here's where the anger was. God's first word to, to ba Balaam was not enough. He had to come back to God as if God is that amnesia and, and changes his mind. So when you hear God's voice and he tells you what to do, and you come back a second time, sometimes in his permissive, he'll let you do what's permissible. That's what you want to do, gone. Then do it. That's what the Holy Spirit told me the um, explanation of that was. He said, well, then go. If the men come and call you, then go and rise up. Go with them. But that's where it is right there. He said, but yet the word which I shall say unto you, that shall you do. So in other words, but still only what I told you, that's what I want you to do. And so that's why he, he was angry with them. But anyway, let's continue to read on. Um, and then even though he went on disobedience, God is trying to stop him. He is saying, uh, don't go. So he rose up, uh, the angel to, to, uh, prohibit him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants was with him. Verse 23. And the ass the donkey, the donkey, uh, the animal was able to recognize the angel standing in the way. And his sword was drawn in his hand. The angel was standing in the way with his sword. And what were you trying to think what he was doing? Telling him, don't come, stay out. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So the ass had enough sense he saw the angel and turned out of the way and understood what God wanted, but not Balaam. Come on, y'all. Come on. I'm telling you, when you start compromising, when you start trying to go halfway with the world and half with God, and you won't obey God's voice, you stop hearing. You will not hear so clearly the voice of the Holy Spirit, and you will not be able to see. There will be, he will bring uh, clouds over your sight. Glory be to God. But here God calls an animal to be able to see the angel with the sword drawn and Balaam could not. And so the, the, the ass is obeying the will of the, of God. Okay. But the angel stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall between being on this side and a wall on the other side. Wait, wait, wait. Um, no, let's, I, I didn't finish reading verse 23. So the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field and look at the actions of Balaam who was sitting on his, this donkey and Balaam smote the ass to turn her back in that way, hit him. Now, like in other words, I'm turning you to go this way, not go the way I want you to go. Look at 24. But the angel of the Lord, second morning, stood in the path of the vineyard, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. So they in between two walls. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord again, she thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. He hit the ass again thinking that the ass is being disobedient. He just don't know. He just don't know. When God says no, he means no. Glory be to God. And here is an example. The culture is saying, don't prophesy to us good things. Don't see, don't prophesy because we don't believe it. Don't see it, don't speak it because I don't believe it. Now here we got the person has been used by God, went in prayer, God gave him the answer, and now he doesn't see. And But the, the animal sees, and the animal is getting abused because he is trying to save this man's life. 
And you can be going with the Lord. And some people always ride on yesterday's anointing. You could be anointed yesterday, last month, and get out of the will of God and be a disobedient in that anointing, that that uh, impartation of the anointing lifts off of you when you get into disobedient. And then you be trying to operate the same way and it ain't there. And God in his mercy, he tries to warn you. He tries to give you every chance to come back into alignment to to the obedience of his word and what he told you to do. And here was the result. It is anger proceeding out of Balaam until he is striking this animal. Hallelujah. Unjustly. But anyway, let's continue to go on. And he smote her again. Verse 26. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn. So, okay, he in the open field, then he hems him between two walls and the donkey tries to turn around, crush his foot third time. And the angel now went further and stood in a more narrow place where there was no way to turn, neither to the right hand or the left. How many times is God going to try to show you? Hallelujah. His mercy, I said in the opening scripture today, thank God that his mercy endure forever. But sometimes we push it, you all, and his mercy will do it forever. But as sometimes he will stand back after your disobedience, which is the problem with the children of Israel and Egypt and, uh, and everything. He will step back, take his hands out and let you be a victim of your choice, but his mercy still will endure forever. He will find a way to deliver those who are obedient, who are innocent, etc. And so then now the Lord on the third time has to now cause this angel to try to get Balaam's attention. And he says, and the ass saw the angel of the Lord and she uh, then fell down. Um, wait a minute. I lost my place. Yes. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord again, she fell down under Balaam. She fell down underneath him and Balaam's anger was kindled. That means like a you put uh, more wood on the fire to kindle that fire and make it grow. His anger is growing now against this donkey. Now something should have told him something is wrong. Three times this, this donkey is disobeying me and doing crazy stuff. But anyway, let's continue to read. It was kindled and he smote the ass this time with a staff. Verse 28, and the Lord opened the mouth. Y'all got to get it. Y'all got to get this story. You got to see it. See it in action. See it in action. So now God gives this animal, this ass, this donkey a voice. What would y'all done if y'all if y'all dog been barking, woo, 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 trying to tell you he hungry, whatever? And then all of a sudden he said, "I'm hungry." <laughs> what you think you gonna do? You probably get your bags and say that house is cursed. Something has happened because what well, a dog ain't supposed to be talking. What well, that's kind of like it sounds funny, but that's kind of like what was happening. The the donkey is trying to do it in actions and say, "I see something that you don't see that you should be seeing." Come on, somebody. And um, you haven't saw it. So the Lord said, I'm going to give it a voice. Come on, God will use whatever. Hallelujah. And he opened up his mouth. And this is what he said to Balaam, the ass, the dunk. He said to Balaam, what have I done unto you that you have smitten me these three times? Oh, boy, I would have been like, what in the world is going on? A donkey talking? I probably would have fell down on my knees right there and said, oh my Lord, what's going on? And look, 29, and Balaam said it to the ass. So he's now, he's so angry and so up in arms trying to appease the age and the culture. Hallelujah. And now he's speaking to a donkey. I don't even know if he's conscious that he's talking to an animal, but let's read. <laughs> And Balaam said unto the ass, Behold, thou hast mocked me. I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I will kill thee. So he, he's angry with the ass that if I had a sword right now, you wouldn't even be alive. But look, let, let's come on. Let's go on with the story. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass upon which you have written ever since I was yours? It says thine. Until this day, I've been um, I've been your vehicle to, to, to take you where you need to go. You've written me since I you owned me up until right at this moment. And this is what the ass says. Was I ever want to do so unto thee? Did I ever do any of these things to you? Did I ever not obey you? And he said, nay. He's answering that, the animal back saying, no, you, you have not done that. Look at verse 31. I'm telling you, the devil will make a fool out of you. He will get you so hot, intense in your agenda, what you want to do, uh, blending with the culture. You, you want to go and be... I don't know. It could have been he he was impressed by their false accolades. I don't know what the thing was, but here he is in disobedience to God, angry now with a faithful animal. The animal is speaking and he's talking back to him like a human being. He's so angry. Not logical, but he's angry. Look at the verse 31. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And then now he realized what the donkey was doing. The donkey was being used by God as instrumental in an effort to try to save his life, in an effort to try to get him not to disobey God's first command that he, God said, don't you go with them. In his first effort to say, you're hanging out with a group of people that you shouldn't be hanging out with. They have impure motives. They are trying. Do you really understand? They're trying to curse a people that God has told you is blessed. And who is it that can curse that which God has blessed? Let's continue to read. And he fell flat on his face. Why? Because he realized his error. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore has thou smitten, smitten your ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand you because the way is perverse before me. It means, he says, I came out to stand against and to resist you for your behavior is willfully uh, disobedient and contrary before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times, unless she had turned from me, unless she had did what she did. Surely now also I would have to have slain you. I would have had to kill you and save this donkey alive. And Balaam, why did, would the angel have had to kill him because you cannot go against what God has ordained. And he was about to do that. And if he was going to allow the enemy to use him as an instrument to curse God's people, God had to stop him. And the angel was there to do the work. And the donkey was there to try to save Balaam's life. And what am I saying? If we take the same disposition that Balaam took, we are trying to conform to this world, trying to make the gospel uh, uh, acceptable, bringing it down to the level where human flesh can uh, relate to it, trying to be uh, conformed to this world instead of being transformed and trying to blend in and to be all things to all people, to be the popular uh, Christian, the friendly Christian, the Christian who don't ruffle anybody's feathers, if you will, because of the word that they preach, giving them the Twinkie so everybody and all people from all places, from all ethnicity could love coming to our, our houses of worship, could love coming to our ministries, could love coming in our midst because we don't make them feel uncomfortable with what we, we just preach all of this love, 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 which we supposed to do is part of it by love will men know that you are my disciples uh, by loving kindness people are drawn to me but not the love where you're letting them go as we just read earlier about 
the, the opening scriptures, I said, um, better is the wounds of a friend than kisses of an enemy. We love them, love them, love them so much that we are letting them die in their sins. And many of them don't know because you don't tell them. And if you don't tell them, they don't hear. How can they hear without a preacher? How can the preacher preach except you be sent? How can they know the truth? If the, those who got the truth won't say to them the truth, how would they know the way? Hallelujah. Except you tell them and you may be the answer to God saving their lives. They are on the road of destruction. And God tell you to say, if you keep going in the way that you're going, you're going to reach to re, uh, uh, go into destruction. That could be their very last chance before they being taken out of this world. But because you want to be the nice Christian, because you don't want to be said that you are over the top, one of those over the top Christians, you one of those Jesus believers or whatever it is that you fear standing up in your righteous authority and stand obedient to God's command and, and true to the great commission. Glory be to God. And you want to blend in this world so that you could be all things to all people and be the Christian everybody loves. And then he's saying here, your life would not have been saved, but this donkey saw something that you should have saw. And and we compromise and our voices compromise. We blend and we say everything. And we'll, I've never seen so much in the age. That's why you cannot get attached to any uh, popular personality. You can't get so fixated on on the 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 most popular preacher, bishop, pastor, teacher, and uh, coach, and life instructor. And i never seen an age where when people of God are standing up, not for religion, not for our own rules and regulations that we grew up with, but I'm talking about staying true and faithful to God's word, the, the foundation by which they even got saved. And now we're getting at this culture and we think we're, we're, we are watering down the word because we think we want to be all things to all people and what we grew up with was not what they need today it, it's the word of god that is exactly what the world needs today the reason we got what we got because we are trying to water the word down to to please everybody at every every level but god told me to tell you today he don't worry people of god those of you who said we're the true preacher we're the true voices god got them i here's one of them and he has a remnant of them who is not bowing their knee to Baal, who is not bowing they their knee uh, to the status quo who is not bowing their knee to conform to the culture but here is to to change the culture and to, we are not here to adopt to the culture when we're going to say it. And because we're saying by our own brothers and sisters in Christ, this is part of the last time um, accounts in Matthew 24. He said, brethren going to be against brethren because we're going to all claim to be still in the body of Christ. And, and brethren is going to come against brethren, preacher against preacher. When those who are standing up for God, they're going to call us deep, so deep. Oh, holy roller. They're going to call us, uh, um, uh, what do I want to say? Religious. They're going to call us stuck in the ages and we got to adapt to the culture and we can't be condemned. They're going to call us haters. They're going to call us being judges and the list go on. So going back to Jeremiah's story, when we say I was formed in his mother's womb, we did not understand the depth of what God had just said to him, God was putting him in the less than desirable position that God was would ever put a person and him being at a great age. And if you're not willing, hallelujah, to be God's spokesperson, if you're not willing to stand up in this last day and take whatever comes with it, hallelujah, we see the example of one right here. Glory be to God, because they're going to tell you seers don't see, prophets don't don't prophesy. Prophetess, don't prophesy. Hallelujah. Don't see nothing. Don't, don't get the visions from God. And if you don't do it, God will take a donkey and use it. Glory be to God. So people keep on even a side nugget again. People always talking about women preaching, women pastors. Where would the church be if the missionaries and the people wasn't praying when the men was not going to church, when the majority of the church was women and still is today? If God couldn't use who he wanted to 
to you. And if he can make a donkey to speak and if God, and make a donkey see the angel and be in obedience to God's will, if you are not going to go, God will use whomever he wants to speak his word. Glory be to God. And I have much more to say on that, but not for this lesson. And what am I saying? He said, if it wasn't for you, your life would not be saved if it weren't for this donkey. Come on, let's get, I'm going to finish this up. And I thought I was going to have more to give you all. Got a little bit more, uh, maybe one or two scriptures to give you, maybe not in detail. Um, but I've been with you already long and I don't want to go over my time. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. See, he at least he admitted, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeased thee, I will get me back again. I will return to, from where I come, if you would allow me to do that. And verse number 35 said, And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, that thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the princess of Balak, and he probably knew that he was going there to be in agreement. He said, Now go, but only what I said for you to say, say. Because his map probably was already made up. I'm going to make a deal. Verse 35. And when Balak heard that Balaam came, he went out to meet him unto a city of Moab, which is in the border of Ammon, which is in the utmost coast. And Balak said unto Balaam, did I not earnestly send unto thee to call thee? Wherefore camest thou not unto me? Am I not able indeed to promote you to honor? He said, who are you to disordain? This disdain me as being a king. Do you know I have the ability to promote you? Well, listen, people of God, they may tell you that. Do you know I have the ability to withhold this from your church? Do you know I have the ability to do this and I have the ability to do that? You know I have the ability to close you down. Do you have, know I have the ability to tell so and so and so and so? They don't. Promotion comes not from man, promotion comes from the Lord. Promotion, the scripture says, does not come from the east and west. He said, it is God who puts up one and take down another. For promotion comes from the Lord. But if you fear men, if they telling you, don't say that, don't, don't, don't uh, uh, sign that agreement, don't line up with those people who believe that, just stay neutral and they promising you this stuff. And if you do, we'll promote you, we'll do this and that. And if they do just what Balaam did, they will get the same result that Balaam would have. Because it's as the last, God got the last say. And you don't have to sell out. You don't have to sell out. Because it is God who is the one that you're going to be facing at the end. Let's continue to read. So nobody has your promotion in their hand or in their mouth. So if they telling you don't see it, don't speak it, just be quiet. I, we know we 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 uh honor we honor your decisions, but just stay quiet about it. And we know some laws right now they trying to pass, and they just trying to say that we're not this. This is what we are. We are not the Christian believers believe that they have to um um to reject their faith by believing this, what we're doing with this. And they try to justify it and it's not justifiable. But anyway, I don't want to go into that because I know I've started talking on it and that's not for this lesson. But anyway, and Balaam said, lo, I am coming to thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? He asked him, King, now I'm here. Can I say something? The word that God put in my mouth that is what I'm going to speak. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The words that God put in Pastor Betty mouth, that is what I'm going to speak. And I'm determined not to speak it no more or no less, Lord. And the Holy Spirit, because I asked him to, to help me not to ever to speak any more, any less, he's let me do it. And that's why sometimes I'm about to release it. He said, not now, not for this broadcast. Then I shut it down. Glory be to God, because I don't want to speak no more, no less, because he has the proper time for it to be spoken. And that should be your agenda as well. Whatever he says, speak, I speak. Whatever he says, I say. Because let God be true in every man in the life. Hallelujah. Whatever God said, it is in stone. It can be un un overturned. It can be uprooted. It is what he says. Okay, let's continue to go back. He said, that is what I'm going to speak. Whatever God put in my mouth. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came into uh, a Kerjath 
Huzoth. And Balak offered oxen and sheep and sent to Balaam and to the princes that were with him. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak, Balak took Balaam and brought him into the high places of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. Verse 4 in chapter number 23 of Numbers. And God met Balaam and he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. If you, I, I just heard the Holy Spirit, if you find yourself in a difficult situation where you have been given an ultimatum and you're a Christian believer and, and something that you hold dear, like a position or career or whatever is at stake based off of your answer, always make a sacrifice of prayer unto God and always be obedient to his voice, but then seek wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and only be determined to speak out of your mouth what the Lord says. He will give you wisdom of how to verbalize it and to be a great orator to those who you have to present either a no to or whatever God said he was going to speak through you that you would be able to speak it exactly in simplicity, accuracy, and with boldness and know when the right timing is. And so now Balaam, um, uh, verse four, and God met Balaam and he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars and I have offered unto every altar a bullock and a ram. So don't release a word until it's time. That's what I mean. Uh, premature speaking. The Lord even told the disciples, when I send you out, don't take no purse, meaning money or your provision. I'm going to provide that. Don't take no script. What well, was a script? What you're going to say, what's written. He told us even when we're in prayer and everything, don't be worried about what you're going to say because I'm going to give you in the right hour what you should say because what he gives you in that specific moment, in that hour is appropriate, it's effective, and it will do the work. But a word spoken out of due season, it is, it's not nice. <laughs> Glory be to God. And he said, verse five, and the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. So here comes the word of, from God and said, return unto Balak and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned to him and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, have bought me from Aram and out of the mountains of the east saying, come, curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. And here is the, here's verse eight. Come on, underline it, highlight it. How, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Or how can I defy whom the Lord has not defied? And how can you do so? He's trying to curse people, put wrenches in their plans, and God has blessed them. You're trying to defy them, and God has chosen and appointed them you better be careful okay let's keep going for from the top of the rocks i see him and from the hills i behold him lo the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the among the nations who can count the dust of jacob the number of the fourth part of israel let me die the death of righteousness and let my last end be like this and Balak said unto Balaam, what hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse my enemies and behold, you have blessed them all together. <laughs> Woo, shut, that's a word. Who God will take your enemies, the one who mean your uh, destruction and your demise. And he will take the very enemy and use them to bless you. Glory be to God. Because if that blessing is on you, stop fighting people. I tell you, I never fight people. I see the enemy working in them. I said, they only knew that God said, when they contend with me, they contend with God. And if I am uh, spewing out love their way and they're not receiving it. I would rather for them just not to receive the love and say, I don't even, I don't like your niceness. I don't like you want to do good by me. 
and, and I will just go away. But when I come to you and I come in your presence and I don't know you or I haven't seen you in years and you keep contending with me, you keep hating on me without a cause because the Bible talks about being angry with your brother without a cause. When you come and set yourself up as an enemy that you're going to try to put a wrench in anything I do, whether that is defaming my name, using spiritual slander or, or whatever it is, it's just being abrasive every time you see me. You better be careful because you cannot curse whom God has blessed. Hallelujah. The anointing or whatever it is that you see in my life that you don't like, you can be a recipient of it if you just make yourself available. If you turn from that, that nasty way of yours and turn to, to the ways of God, you can be partakers of the same thing because God is known to respect a person. What he done for one, he can do for you. That's why in my life, I never saw the purpose of jealousy. It's just foolishness to me. Now, I'm not saying that I am perfect in any way, but that one thing I have to say, I never liked it. I saw something as a young person in regard to that, a group of people who looked like they were best of friends. And each time one was dismissed and went their way, the group that was left behind was dogging their name. And I saw something clicked in me and I saw jealousy is as cruel as the grave. And if that's what it looks like, if that's what friendship is, I didn't want. And I saw jealousy as something, I don't know if my mother building me a high esteem or if, it, if that came from God or where that came from. I never saw a reason to be jealous of another. If I just took time of uh, uh, trying to search out what I'm supposed to do, trying to understand what I'm supposed to do, trying to please God. How, I don't have time to be looking at somebody's life and covenant it and wanting it. Now, I may be weak in another area, but that has never been my weak part because I don't know if I had a good self-image of myself. Not all the time because people, people doubt that, but that's another story. But in other words, I just saw jealousy as so... So un, I don't know, unnecessary. But anyway, but here, look. Um, and Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done to me? You have come and you have I asked you to curse him and you blessed them all together. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord has put in my mouth? And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee with me unto another place from whence thou mayest see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and thou shalt not see them all, and curse me them from thence. And he brought him into the field. I'm not going to continue to read the rest. Hallelujah. And anyway, so um, let's go down to verse number 19. Uh, let's read 18 first for context. And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken it to me, thou son of Zephor. God is not a man. Come on, underline this scripture. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Have he said, and shall he not do it? Or have he spoken and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandments to bless and he has blessed. And I, me, in my own, my ability, I cannot reverse it. I cannot reverse it. So why did I bring this up in, re in reference or connection with my title? Just speak what God tells you to speak when they don't want you to speak it. Preach it when they don't want you to preach it. Herald it when they don't want you to herald it. Hallelujah. Confirm it even when they don't want you to confirm it. Preach to the utmost parts of the earth. Be instant. Don't don't be flaky. Stand flat footed. And we're going to I'm going to give you that scripture. That's what I think the Lord going to have me to end with. Um, the scripture where he told Jeremiah. Um, uh, and because you cannot fear to the point of disobedience to God's assignment. We know what happened with Saul. He was excommunicated. God, God uh, rejected him because of his disobedience. He said he was doing it in the name of the Lord, but God had given him, remember I said earlier, you got to get the instructions from God and follow it down to the very minute detail. No adding, no subtracting. And he said, oh, Lord, 
uh, I didn't kill the sheep, the best of the sheep. It was some good stuff in that land, the spoils. We went in and destroyed most of it, but we say he saved the king. He saved the best of the cattle, the sheep, oxen, he and the good silver and gold. God said, destroy every single thing there. And then when the prophet said, did you obey God? He said, oh yeah. And he said, liar. That's, he didn't say it like that, but liar, what is the, the what then mean the bleeding of the sheep in my ear that I hear? And then he started to justify, oh, well, we say that we know that, that God is on our side. We saved that to sacrifice unto the Lord. And God said, obedience is better than any sacrifice or what you want to give to present to me as your worship. Your worship should have been your obedience. Oh, that's a good one. Your worship, your obedience is your worship. And so in other words, I would have rather saw for you to obey me than to say disobey me and try to offer up some sacrifice that I won't even accept anyway because it's out of disobedience. And so here, Jeremiah, I have set you to be a spokesperson and a voice and ordain you before you were forming your mother's womb to be a voice to this nation as a child. Yes, as a child. And so when he tells you what to do, just like we saw in this story, you cannot be disobedient to his assignment. And let's read Jeremiah chapter one, going down to verse 16. And I will end with this and come back, if you will, next week so we can go even further and bring it to contemporary times. 16, and I will utter my judgments against them, touching all of their wickedness who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Thou therefore gird up your loins and arise. This is God's voice to Jeremiah after he told him, uh, he's calling to the nation. He said, therefore, gird up your loins and arise and speak uh, to them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces because you're going to get some looks and the world going to give you some looks. They're going to give you some more than look. They're going to sing you a little words and they're going to tell you a little bit off their mind. Glory be to God. Be not dismayed at their faces lest I this is what would happen to him if he disobeyed Lest I confound you before them if you dare to disobey these instructions. For behold, I have made thee this day. Don't worry, because early he told the Lord when God gave him um, that he's calling him. He said, Lord, I'm just a child. He said, I don't even know what to say, what I'm going to say. They're going to come against me. This is what the Lord is promising him. I have made you this day a defense city. What do that mean? That means you are protected. It's just like a city who have great a great front line of defense for you, any enemy, to try to penetrate. It is very strong. It has a militant force in front of it, prohibiting anything to break through and make a breach in the walls of protection. God said, if you obey me, against these people, hallelujah, and you obey my voice, I will make you a defense city and an iron pillar. A pillar of iron. It's hard to come against an, <laughs> a pillar of iron. That means it's very established. And brass and walls against the whole land, against all the kings of Judah, against all the princes thereof, against all the priests who ain't really priests, thereof and against any of the people. So God cover all the base. I don't care if they're king, priest, prophet, king, a uh, prince, whatever it is, they will not be able to come against you because you are my defense city. Isn't that good news? <clears throat> do you think God would do any different for us today? For those who set themselves to speak his square, even when the world is saying, don't see it, don't prophesy it, don't speak it, we don't believe it. I'm going to add another one because, and we really surely don't want it. <laughs> it don't matter, y'all. I done gave y'all enough. Go back and, and, and rehearse those scriptures, hallelujah, and see why 
you got to do it if God tells you to do it. And this job, let me just give y'all this 411. This job has been given to the fivefold ministry gift, but it, it doesn't exempt you. It's, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're born again and you're a Christian believer and a son of God, this is your mandate as well. You just have it at a different level than we have. But you are to take even with your man and woman of God and you are to be, it says sheep beget sheep, not shepherd beget sheep, but sheep of the same kind beget sheep. The shepherd job is to nurture and to train and mature the sheep. Then the sheep is to go out there and to reproduce other sheep. So you have a role and the, and the people who are your shepherds has a role. And we all got to do our part because we all got to give an account. We all have an assignment. We all have a purpose in this kingdom mandate. Come on, y'all. Hallelujah. And he said, uh, if you don't obey me, I'll reduce you before then. And let's go down and continue to read that scripture. Verse 18. I will make you a defense city in iron pillar, brass and walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. Verse 19. And they shall fight against you. I'm giving you the 411. I'm not going to give you. No, I'm not. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to give you a heads up. They ain't going to like it. That's what I just told y'all. They're going to tell that to us, that phrase. I, Y'all know the subject by now. Don't speak it. Don't say it. We don't believe it and we don't want it. That's all right. He said, you, and you, when you make that stand, they ain't going to like it. And he said, and that for, for they're not going to believe you. And they will fight against you. But they shall not prevail against you. No weapon that is formed against me shall pros prosper. And every lying tongue that rises up against me in judgment, it will be condemned. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And y'all could put some more scriptures in there. Don't y'all feel the presence of the Lord? Don't you feel him charging you up? Don't you feel like you hooked to this big old generator and God is re rejuvenating you, revitalizing you, restoring you? Hallelujah. Giving you everything necessary. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and, and if not, keep on sticking with this word. Keep on coming back. Pastor Betty is going to be in your corner. And we're going to, we're coming to the filler station on Sunday. And our vehicle may have been, our gauge may be almost on E because we've been giving out of ourselves, imparting ministry into the world that we live in and our surrounding. And we, but we know where to come back to get filled up again. And you're here and the Holy Spirit is, is charging me. And as he's charging me, hallelujah i'm charging you all come on y'all we are capable we are able we are more than conquerors through jesus christ we are able to do this he said so and if he said it i believe it that is the settling of it huh Woo! glory to god hallelujah and i shall fight against thee but they shall not prevail against thee for i am with thee said the lord to deliver you Mm -mm -mm. And I want to just pay attention. And I'm giving you the same charge that the Lord told Jeremiah, gird up your loins. Where's the loins? The, the your mid part. It is the a part um, uh, that usually people who is about to go to battle a soldier, they usually gird up that, that, that part. Uh, so gird up your loins is a phrase often you will see that is in the Bible and they make reference to an urgent call um to get ready for immediate action is able to, for you to be able to embrace what you're about to uh embark upon or it may be a call to prepare you for a coming action or a coming event and we know that the that event that is coming and is of uh urgency that many are not talking about is that Jesus is coming soon and he wants the believers to gird up the loins, gird up your loins. And we got to take this example that I gave you through this story today. It's not just a biblical story. This is not just a book in history. This is, he's more than the word 
uh, uh, um, on the page uh, in history. He is the everlasting, the right now, the omnipresent God. Hallelujah. Working in and through his people who would, would dare to be obedient to his will. And so when he said, gird up your loins, Pastor Betty is preparing you all. And I'm telling you the same thing. Soldier, hallelujah. You may be getting a little weary and tired. Go on, do what you need to get filled up again. Take a little rest because what's coming ahead, you ain't going to have the uh, leisure of always fainting and need to take a nap and a rest because the enemy is under attack. He is taking the young people out of here like crazy. He's taking the old, the young, the middle age. He is up in his ante and we must too. And the way we do that is... Uh, Ephesians 6 and 11, the whole armor of God. And it says the belt of truth, but around that loin, we're girding up the loins of our minds. So throughout the Bible, you will see this phrase and it's talking about uh, getting prepared for a coming action or an event. This phrase is also related to the type of clothing that uh, men of valor and people of war uh, wore in the ancient times. And what was it used for? It was to keep them from Petting the weaver through any um, um uh, through any vigorous activity like battle or exercise or strenuous work, it was to uh, fortify um, the mid core of your body for the loose ends of the garments of that um, that one that was fighting. We look at the whole knight in shining armor thing is what they usually fought in. No, they didn't all the time in ancient times. They had these uh, vestures on and they were made of leather most of the time. But then the person who was on the front line of defense, then they put these little things like chain links, little bitty small chain links together so that it could uh, help uh, uh, the penetration of a sword or a weaver going through their the most critical parts of them that would cause fatality. And so then they were, that, that garment was kind of loose. And in the process of girding up their loins, they would take that garment and they, and the tunic or the cloak, and they would take the loose end of that garment and they would gather it up and tuck it inside that girdle, which was around their loins. And that was called, called girding up the loins, hallelujah, so that they would be ready for battle. So those loose ends would not get in the way. And then that midriff part of them would be protected and fortified for the battle. The girdle was a band about six inches wide that hold fasteners in the front. And it was worn, worn around the loins. And we just said that was the midsection of the body between the lower ribs and the hips, and it was normally made of leather. And so that's what I'm saying. Gird up the loin, spiritually speaking. Gird up that core of you. You're, you know, many times my brother tell me all the time, your core is weak. You don't have really truly good either upper a body strength or lower body strength because your core is weak. But if you get that core strong, both of those things start to strengthen themselves. And I'm saying in the spirit, I'm telling you to gird up your spiritual loins in the name of the Lord Jesus. Gird yourself, tuck in those loose ends in the name of the Lord Jesus inside that girdle so it can keep you standing strong and erect, ready for the battle. Glory be to God. So I am going to end with that because I know that the Holy Spirit said that we're done. Thank you, Lord. Come back next week you all we're going to go and read a lot in the book of jeremiah and we're going to talk and uncover these false prophets we're going to show you their mo we're going to give you some uh tools of how to decipher true prophecy and true prophets versus false prophecies and false prophets because it's getting to the point is 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 got to be a person who is very spiritual to catch some of this because some of it is some of this is what people are saying is right on the borderline. It sounds good. It sounds reasonable. It sounds like they're on the side of, of humanity and, and on the side of love. And they want us not to be so overbearing. This and, and it sounds nice. It sounds like we should not be judgmental and et cetera, et cetera. We're going to hopefully discuss what does God truly mean by who are you to judge another brother? Is that mean that everybody just stay silent and stay neutral and nobody say anything to anybody because all of us got beams in our eye. We can't take the moat out of others. We got to start balancing these scriptures and know what they mean and stop giving a, 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 a little weak interpretation of what God's law truly means until we are so passive and we are blending like the chameleon because of fear of us 
getting some title put on us. And that's kind of like where uh, Balaam was. He wanted just to see, he wanted to know, maybe I could get to this honor, maybe this and this and that. And he disobeyed what God first told. He could have saved all of that because God told him what it was. God just, sometimes God would allow, hallelujah, do not um, you permissively give you the permission to do what you're going to make a choice about anyway, even though he tells you and let you know. But if you're not seeking God and you're not walking out the spirit, your, your antennas, your frequencies, your spiritual frequencies are a little off and you get static. And sometimes you hear you have a little truth mixed with a lot of error, but you hone in because that's what you used to. You hone in on the little truth and then before you know it, you're going with it and you didn't understand that the error is, is so much error in it that that little truth that you're aligning yourself with, God didn't intend for you to do that. I can keep on talking, but I'm not going to. Thank God for all of you. And the word of the Lord is blessed. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord is blessed. Not because Pastor Betty delivered it, but the word of the Lord, which I read to you, it is blessed. It is the final authority. And we thank God that every single one of you who have heard this word, We'll take note of the word. We'll put it to my application. And if you say, I didn't find myself in that. I knew all that. I'm there. I'm right at wherever I am. Well, praise God. Then you were listening for someone else for you to now be a deliverer of this word or to point somebody to this word that you know needed. The things of the spirit, you all cannot be discerned carnally. The Bible said it's foolishness to those who are carnal. And so some of the things that we preach and say, even Christian believers will not be able to digest it because they are too carnal. Hallelujah. They are still on what I call the milk of the word, even though the years and the quantity and the longevity that they've been with the Lord does not match. Hallelujah. They should be more mature than that, but it doesn't matter how old you get. If you're not applying yourself to truth, and if you are not walking circumspectly, and if you are not walking after the spirit, but after the flesh only, these things will sound foolish to you. And that's why the Christian believer to the culture today sounds foolish, old fogey. And, and that was back then. That's what a lot of people are saying. But I am going to bring uh, another viewpoint and let you draw your own conclusion. I love all of you with the love of Jesus. Thank you all for staying with me. Hallelujah. Throughout the entirety of this sermon. And if you're listening at it in parts and you finally get here, I still thank you for listening at it, at it in its entirety, even if it was through the parts. To all of my wonderful partners, love you with the love of Jesus. You are blessed people indeed. You have a harvest, hallelujah, that is coming and it's not going to stay in the field. It is time for the gathering of the harvest. You have sown much and God is ready to release the harvest so that it can come from the field to your table so that you can partake of the goodness of the Lord right here in the land of the living because we don't have a lot of time and he is going to bless you every single thing that I do that is going to abound to your account. We have did, since we have shared with you all the recap of 2023, we, we want you to know we are busy still doing things, some wonderful things. We, we still want to share it with you guys at the end of the year to culminate it, but hopefully we'll be able to share a little snippets of things as we doing things quarterly, but we have done some other things that we know all of you who are partnering with this ministry will be very pleased. If you have not considered partnering with this ministry in a monetary way, we ask you to, to consider that. Uh, and um, we know many of you, like I told, even though I'm partnering with some people, they think that I'm not I'm partnering only with them, but I'm not. There's other things I do. So although many things come up with that, the one uh, uh, organization that I network with and partner with, I cannot put all my eggs in one basket because I have to do what the Holy Spirit leads me to do. So they may not see that I give over here and give over here. The neither Pastor Betty may not don't see where you are giving your uh, donations to or who you are partnering with. We just saying if you are not part partnering with anyone or if you have 
place in your budget in addition to who you are partnering with and you uh, see this ministry as a ministry to partner with, we're not going to tell you how to do that. You could do it monthly, which is what we recommend or what we desire, uh, a monthly uh, basis, or you could do it quarterly, semi-annually, annually, or as the Holy Spirit leads, we just ask you to consider as we set ourselves to be an instrument in this last hour to show the love of Jesus to those who don't know yet. And how do we do that? Through the works of ministry. And then as we feed their bellies and as we minister to their natural needs, it opens up that door for us to now share Christ with them. And many are coming to Christ just for that reason. Glory be to God. So we love you partners. Thank God for you so much. We're praying for all of you to my friends, my colleagues in the ministry, and to all of the people who are on the front line. Pastor Betty, often the Lord brings different pastors um, in my past and some I know of now, still know of, and then new ones that, that come across my mind. Even some I see on social media have never met them in my life. And I see the works that they're doing. And, and there are many times the Holy Spirit leads me to say a prayer and I cover you because I know what this work is about. I have firsthand account of what being on the front line is, is like. It is not easy. It is not for the faint at heart. There's times you feel lonely. There's times you are, are, are feeling isolated. There's times that you just want to chill and relax, but you know that there is a dire need uh, and your assignment is too important, hallelujah, and you get on there, and I, and the list go on, but with that being said, we love what we do, because we know when we're doing it, that thing I talked to you about, being obedient to God's will, is the most perfect place in the whole wide world, is being in the will of the Lord, if you don't know the Lord now, um, Today, you never give him a try. You never made him Lord, ruler over your life. You've been ruling your life and you've been making a mess out of it. Or you've been doing quite so good, but you still have this void. That's because there's a place in mankind that is supposed to only be occupied by one person that will make you fulfilled. And that place is your heart where Jesus is supposed to occupy that and take kingship over. And you have not made the Lord of uh, Lord of your life. And you say, how do I do that? Simply by uh, confessing him as Lord, giving him that that rulership over your life, relinquishing your control, let him take control, believing that he was your savior, believing you were a sinner that needed a savior, and then confessing that he gave his life, died on the cross for your sins and is sitting at the right hand of the father. And that's all it requires. And then a mind to just say, how do I live a life pleasing to him? And then be willing to become a disciple of him and then just denounce Satan and the world, and then take on a new king in your life and let him sit on the throne, throw Satan off the throne and put the Lord on the throne. And then you will be one of his. And you say, how do I do that? Simply by saying this prayer after me, confessing it and not just confessing it, saying some words because I tell you to say it. But whenever you're confessing, you're making an acknowledgement when you confess it. You're saying, I agree to this statement of truth. And then, then believing what you say, simply say this prayer to me, say, Heavenly Father, I come to you now admitting that I am a sinner that needs a savior. I thank you, Father God, that you sent your son Jesus as a savior to save those who were lost. I ask you, Father God, to come into my life and be Lord of my life. I confess with my mouth and believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for my sins. But on the third day, he was risen from the dead and is now sitting alive at the right hand of the Father. By my confession of faith, and my belief in your son, Jesus, I now know and believe that I am now saved. Take lordship of my life. Come, Lord, live your life in me and live your life through me. From this day forward, I acknowledge and commit 
that I belong to you. Now I ask you to come and fill me, Lord, with the Holy Spirit so that I may be able now to live a life that is pleasing unto you. Thank you, Lord, now for saving me. It is in your son's name I pray and confess this prayer. It is in your name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, God. You have made the best decision you will ever make in your whole and entire life. Would you do Pastor Betty a favor? Would you reach out to us at our email at klcc1207 at yahoo.com? You can find all our other information down below our website, our email address, and our social media platforms. And you can connect to us that way. But send us an email to let us know you you. You receive Christ for the first time in the subjects that receive Christ in the body of the letter. Give us your name. Give us where you're, your location, like your city and state. And let us know if you desire to become a member of this church. Hallelujah. Or you want to think about it. Or you don't want to be a member. Either way, just please send us an email as a record of your visit, as a measurement of our effectiveness on these broadcasts in drawing, hallelujah, the souls to the Lord. And then if you're a backslider that said that prayer, or you didn't go back and say, just ask the Lord to come back and reclaim you, you ready to rededicate your life to Lord. You can say some of the components of the prayer that I just give to the new believer. And then you have been rededicated. Now, come on, get up, take up that slack, realize where you fell off at and don't go in that way again. Get back into a spiritual growth through reading of your word, fasting and praying. Get discipled, come become humble. Don't get arrogant in this and then get back connected with the church. If you don't have a church, then come like I just made the invitation to those who just got saved. You want to be a member, send us the email in the subject to say, uh, rededicated my life to the Lord. Give us your name, where you're from, and let us know whether or not you want to be a, a member of this ministry. Either in either case, if you don't want to be a member, still let us know. We want to be able to be instrumental in getting you connected to a church where Jesus Christ is center focus and the word of God is the highest authority. If you're a Christian believer, you're not in any of those categories and you just want to connect with this ministry in any way, then you send us an email as well and just let us know what you want to say and whether you want to be a member, whether you want to give us some encouragement or whatever, just let, let it be nice or whatever. And, and, and whatever you want, however you want to connect with the ministry, if you want to uh, volunteer at the ministry or whatever that is, if you want to be an e-member, uh, we have all of that information available to you. We love you with the love of Jesus. Have a fantabulous rest of the Sunday and a fantabulous week coming ahead. You have what it takes, people of God. Don't hear what the word's saying. Keep on standing up as representatives for the Lord. Say what he said, no more, no less. Don't add and no take away. Be powerful, hallelujah, in your assignment. Know that God's got your back. The Holy Spirit is your rear guard and he is your there to support you and he will do what he said with Jeremiah. He will make you a defense city that no weapon that will form against you shall prosper. Therefore, you don't have to be afraid of the arrow that fly by day, nor the terror that comes back night. It, things may be happening all around you, but it will not come nigh your dwelling. I love you all with the love of Jesus right here next time, next week. Come inspect and receive another good meal from the Lord. And I'll be in preparation to make sure that I set the very best before God's precious people. I love you all. You have a fantabulous week. And remember that I am a, a Pastor Betty. Uh, of Kingdom Life Christian Center located on the northwest side of Chicago, Illinois. And I am a pastor who is doing what? Teaching kingdom principles for kingdom living. You all be blessed and we'll talk to you all next week.